It's freaking cold. You got frostbite yet? In the frigid Canadian north, young pilots seeking adventure. That's why all those guys are up here. Battle the elements of World War II planes. Oh, bitch. On this episode, I don't know what to do. Devin battles double engine trouble. Why did number one go down? I don't know. With a rookie in the right seat. Plus, wildfires rage, uh, yeah. and buffalo races to the rescue. We're gonna have four buffalo ducks there in about an hour. Out of your hats, boy. It's late spring in the far north. The sun is up early, and so is Larry Dusso. Buffalo Airways' newest C 46 co pilot is ready to prep his plane and start his day. Barely a month ago, Larry was just another grunt on the ramp. I have to admit that I still had a lot to prove to those captains, especially Devin. Today, Larry will get his chance. Come on, Larry, let's go, boy. Flying with Devin Brooks on a delivery flight up the Mackenzie Valley. Okay, it won't that. be easy. He's not an easy captain to fly with. He expects a lot out of you. Flying a 65-year-old warbird to remote corners of the north, Devin likes having the input of a seasoned co-pilot. Oh, you need to rely on him for information. At the end of the day, it's the captain's decision whether to go back, shut an engine down, or any course of action. But it's always good to get real good input from your first officer. But Devin has little patience for rookies. Larry learned that recently during training when he failed an emergency drill. What's wrong with your plane? What's wrong with it? I wouldn't be able to tell you what's wrong with it. Well, you better. It's not just flying a plane, Larry. You gotta know where the stuff is. I'm not a big teacher, that's why I get pissed off. I don't like doing it. So my question too heavy at me, eh? Okay. Devin wants Larry to get a feel for the plane before they face any kind of emergency together. <laughs> like, oh. You gotta learn to trust other people and, uh, and really put your trust in it, because one mistake and all the whole crew are dead. But mechanic Jimmy Essery doubts Larry can be trusted under fire. All right on the right side. Good morning, Buffalo. 509246 on Delta. Right away, Larry's put to the test. Devin hands him control of the takeoff. And the tower, Buffalo 509 is on hotel rates. Right? Takeoff runway 15. Takeoff runway 15. Earth, April roll. Uh, Takeoff, a good start to his day. The crew heads almost 700 kilometers northwest toward the remote settlement of Norman Wells. As they get close, Devin again makes Larry take control. Just for practice, we made him do the approach into Norman Wells. I'll take club one as well. Here's and Larry makes a classic rookie mistake reading his instruments. Asked him two or three times, do you have it dialed up right? Oh yes, oh yes. He doesn't. He set one of his navigation aids for the opposite approach. That was kind of fun. We let him go as far as we could go. Where are you turning here? Where are you turning left? Wrong way. Simple as that, you know. Heading towards the hills. Yeah, we're dead. 
Take a peek out there? Yes, sir. He's really like making you feel really bad and you kind of really suck. You're supposed to be over the water on this one. Roger. <laughs> you really make you look like a fool. But things are about to get much more serious. We had to get our head back in the flight because something happened at that point. The right engine suddenly loses power. I am not. It looks good. I don't know. Tell me what's wrong with this. As we get closer to the runway, uh, the right engine uh, start having problems. Can you hold that? Yep. Number two, no. The throttle was locked, but it just went down on its own, and then I had Jimmy hold it there, and it was just really sensitive. Hey, Jimmy. Oh, yeah. It pulled right there. There was some small thing wrong with the carburetor. It wasn't giving the aircraft the right proper fuel, so it was either too much fuel, and when you cut back, it'd be way too less fuel. Where you hold those throttles? Yep, no problem. There was just something that I had never experienced in a 46 or in an airplane before. Each slight adjustment sends the power levels shooting up or plunging. That was dangerous because at that point you had started having a bit of a yaw left right. I am not. Little girl is not liking this. No. Here we go. Roger. And you're coming in and you've got a, a problem with one engine. Devin fights to keep the plane straight. He's only got one chance to make this landing. Not right with this thing. The cardinal rule is don't overshoot, you know. That'll just get you into real big trouble. Just stay out of the way. <laughs> it's a bad time to have a rookie in the co-pilot seat. On the feet still. Hey, hey. In the air over Norman Wells, Buffalo's C-46 crew is lining up to land with 8,000 pounds of freight and a right engine that refuses to hold its power. It looks good, I don't know. It's a first for rookie co-pilot Larry Dussault. Coming in a month in and having an engine problem and knowing that there's no second chance, this is when I understood, yeah, I'm a pilot here. On the stage still. But Larry's far too green for Captain Devin Brooks to rely on. So he's tackling this one all by himself. On the ground, yeah, definitely felt good. Oh, lordy, lordy, lordy. Devin's already worrying about the next leg of the trip. I gotta give you the rest of these pallets. Okay. Just because I gotta get some stuff out of here, the engines aren't running too good. Mechanic Jimmy Esri thinks there might be a leak in one of the fuel lines. There's nothing the eye can see. Looking for some loose things, trying to find a gas leak on the induction. Manifold go well, but he didn't find anything, so. It's not acting like it's got a gas leak anyways. If there's a gas leak, it'll, it'll flicker. The RPM or manifold pressure will flicker. And it's not, and it's what happens is dropping. I'm in the wells and I gotta get to Toledo. Well, Jimmy's in the same boat as me. He doesn't know what's going on and just started backfiring and the throttles are going all over the place. I have no idea what the hell it's doing. We talked to Rod and made the decision to give it a test flight. I really don't understand it. Well, yeah. super. Uh, either off the Toledo or off the Elevate. The 
final stop on today's valley run is Toledo. The small hamlet is only 85 kilometers away. If there are no more problems, the C-46 crew will make the delivery there. Coming out of Toledo, you're totally empty at that time. So as long as you can land there, taking off out of there, even if you did have a problem, it's still going to fly. But if the engine is still acting up, Devin will bypass Toledo and head straight for home. Climb went perfectly. We climbed high enough and we didn't see anything special, so we elected to go to Toledo. Closing in on Toledo, the crew tries to piece together how the engine could bounce back so quickly. Wonder if we had got to the truck tonight and if not to make the manifold throw that low. Whether or not it was ice temporarily clogging the engine. Hello, it's Berlin. For now, the C-46's problems seem to have melted away. kilometers south in Kelowna, British Columbia. The annual training for Buffalo's firefighting water bomber crew is underway. Take her down like normal and set her up for an 80 knots, like you said. Buffalo's newest duck pilot, Scott Blue, is on his final training run trying to master the perfect scoop. Yeah, about 200 feet a minute, that's just right. Little more north of them. Okay. Under the belly of the plane, two small intakes the size of a shoebox scoop up the water. They fill the two 2,700-liter reservoir tanks in just 10 seconds. When those probes go down, the amount of drag is shocking. It's like someone just threw out a parachute or a giant anchor on the back of the plane. Just That's a good one. is a dream Scott's been chasing since his first day at Buffalo. There was many a day over the years where I'd be having just not the smoothest of go of things at this place, and I'd crawl into the duct that was sitting in the corner and just sort of look around and be like, mm -hmm, okay, all right, I'll put up with this horse shit for a little bit longer. <laughs> so. As Scott and crew head back to land, there's a special visitor waiting to say hello on the Kelowna Airport ramp. I'm trying to give him a hard time, but he's not looking. Buffalo's legendary former chief pilot, Arnie Schrader. Arnie retired and moved to Kelowna last year, but after he arrived, he was diagnosed with lung cancer. He's been undergoing intense treatment ever since, and he's been missing the chance to fly. I'm starting to because I'm feeling better now, so. Yeah, I'm starting to miss it now. But I'll get some in this summer. Yeah, I know it was great. It was, uh, yeah, That's the great. bouncing around was tricky, but like when I first went in and just keeping on the water, that wasn't problem at all. No, like, well, I, I you didn't have the probe down. No, I didn't. Arnie, Arnie has changed a bit since he left, you know, going through some things, but he's, as always, in good spirits with a smile on his face and joking around. Well, I think, yeah, as long as my medical is okay and I feel healthy, I'll maybe go fly that four for a couple months. Just because uh, that's where they need somebody right now. They haven't got anybody for it. Arnie is still eager to fly, and so is Scott. But it's unlikely Scott will get work on the bombers this summer. I know all you can do is just, you know, do whatever flying you can do. You won't, probably won't get much this year on this uh, spare one. Scott will be on the backup crew. He'll only get to fly if there are too many fires for the main crew. Is 
there any more oil kicking around? After doing my last session on the water, it was like, I might not touch this for another year. See you, buddy. Okay. Stay out of See trouble, eh? Where's the fun in that? Yeah. <laughs> in the back. Up in Toledo, the C-46 crew is finishing the last offload of the day. The plane's empty, and Devin feels better about the flight home. There's a lot of stress off my shoulders, off Jimmy's shoulders, and Larry's starting to notice that now. Once you get to Toledo, it's pretty much home free. It looks like their problems are behind them. Ready, Rick. Ready here. Devin, Larry, and Jimmy head for Yellowknife, 600 kilometers away. The flight starts off fine, but then. The Jacob. I'd say it's about 100, 150 nautical miles out of Toledo. Uh, we start having vibration in that same engine. Yep. I started to shake really bad. I had a real good shudder to it. Vibrating. I don't know exactly what it was. That uncertainty is putting the captain on edge. It's jiggling. Still pressure is going. That ain't us. That's when it's frustrating when you've had a day of just an older airplane confusing. And that's what it did that day. It confused the hell out of me. Confused and stuck with a rookie across the cockpit, Devin has to figure out his next move. That's not running right. That's just fucking Jiggling. No pressure is going. Bananas. 9,500 feet up and still over an hour from Yellowknife. Buffalo's C-46 crew is fighting an engine, threatening to shake itself apart. Yeah, she's going through the seat pretty good. Oh, I can feel on the feet. Oh. It's so bad that Jimmy fears the engine won't survive if they keep it running. It had a really good shake to it. it uh, like, we didn't know if we are going to blow this engine up or do we shut this engine down and save it. Without an experienced co-pilot's input, that decision rests entirely on Captain Devin Brooks' shoulders. I did expect from Buffalo that we would encounter some uh, emergency situation. Oh, okay. Okay. Checklist. Yeah, two. But I didn't expect it to be this quickly into my commercial career. You don't need your checklist either. That's a memory item. Yeah, yeah. Boom, 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 real quick. Good. Too slow. Roger. There's number two going. Oh, did you ever shake? I think for sure. But they still have to make a crucial adjustment before the engine fully shuts down. Feather. Oh. Right feather? Yeah. Feathering the prop means adjusting the pitch of the blades so they cut through the air, instead of catching it and windmilling. If something really was to go bad and the engine wouldn't feather, that's a lot of drag. So you want to get it feathered, get it shut down, just so nothing else can happen. Okay. Going from its normal position to feather, back to the normal, back to feather, back to the normal. Making the aircraft uh, pretty uncontrollable. As Devin fights with the stubborn right engine, a brand new problem blindsides him from the left. Now their healthy engine starts misfiring. Just sort of sputtered for a second. 
that made me take my finger off the button there for a second. What the heck is going on with this thing? No, oh, we're gonna be in my shape if that's your cow there. I guess your heart could skip a beat there that one side not feather and then the other just pop. So Devin has Larry quickly restart the right engine. Now Devin can't trust either engine. Zero for two. It's not a good bat in average. I don't know what to do. Still 300 kilometers from home, the crew pushes on, hoping at least one engine holds out. We're sort of in a point of no return. We, we didn't want to go back to the wells. Just keep plugging ahead, right? But if they can't stay airborne, they'll need to find somewhere to make an emergency landing. That's how we start picking out like places like Wati. And, uh, and, and Betchico and Highway. <laughs> I don't know what anybody would have thought to see that big 46 sitting on the highway. None of those options are good ones, but the crew may have no choice. I hope not. Devin has to do something about the vibrating right engine. Just jiggling like a son of a gun, too. I feel it my ass now. The vibration were just getting intense. They were getting uh, getting worse by the minute. We had to throttle back so much it was starting to become a drag. Nothing else to do. Okay. Shut down checklist. Yeah, number two. Devin decides to shut down the right engine again. This time, the prop slides into feather. There we go. I calm down. At that point, we took that decision. Whatever happens after that, we'll deal with it. Now, they're flying on one still suspect left engine. Still nice company, too, so yeah. Coming into radio range, Devin calls in to raise the alarm. Are the engineers there? Travis is here now. Do you want to talk to him? Travis, it was just jiggling. It did something that I, that I don't know, we'll have to explain to you. I've never seen it before. Feels like it's tickling right off that side, so we shut it down. I don't know. That's not right, right? Does the maintenance know? Yeah, maintenance knows. They just called into Roxy and they're coming in on one. The 46 closes in on the Yellowknife runway. Here we were, we were coming in uh, on one engine, and that is a very serious situation. Veteran Captain Devin Brooks and rookie co-pilot Larry Dussault are heading home with a dead engine. The Yellowknife Tower dispatches emergency vehicles just in case. Well, the both fire trucks are ready to go. Yeah, I'm tracking him. He won't. He should become invisible. Hey, I see a plane. It's probably it. No, they're coming down. Don't land before the runway, obviously, and you do not want to overshoot. It's right in the book. Hold print. Do not overshoot on one. Devin needs to time this perfectly. I got a wheel. Yep. We aren't going to come up short, and we aren't going to come up long. Which means he needs to know his exact speeds and engage his flaps at the precise moment. This is where the pilots have to work together as a team. No time for rookie mistakes. Pressure's up, green light. Fire's cold, tail wheel locked, your final bar complete. 98, 92. 98. 85. With 
with Larry's help, Devin slides to 46 right onto runway 09. That is perfect landing. I'll try and uh, get a fire truck to uh, escort you on charge. For Larry, it was a day to remember. I don't know, man. The worst part was shutting down the second engine and then the first one comes off. That's when I really realized, well, holy, I'm a brand new co-pilot, it's my first month and I'm already having an engine problem, uh, landing on one engine and all that stuff. It was a hell of a day. I learned a lot. It's in those situations that you learn most. I don't think he was nervous. I don't think he was scared shitless. If he was scared shitless, he's in the wrong profession. Learn from him. That's all I ask. Although he doesn't trust you and he's, he doesn't really approve you being there, he needs you. I don't know if I surprised him, but I know I surprised myself. It's a new morning, and Buffalo's getting set for a very different kind of job. I've never really decorated a plane. I don't know how Joe's gonna take it when he sees it. Should like it, I don't see why not, but uh, these are his babies. We also got a, uh, a card for everybody to sign. Yeah, that's true. So that'll be nice. Rookie co-pilot Chris Barton and flight attendant David Alexander are setting up the DC-3 for a very special party. So we decorate the uh, subtle but tasteful the toilet as well, or? Let's just close it and no one ever sees it. Subtlety is a rare quality at Buffalo, but this is a very rare occasion. Alan O'Reilly and Jessica Simpson are getting married in the air. Well, my boyfriend, he seems, well, he's my fiance now. He seems to have a really good imagination. And he, we were sitting around one day and he said, why don't we get married in a DC-3? And I said, well, if you can organize it, then let's do it. Good to see you, Joe. I got my, I don't want any. I got oh, here Celtic we go. ring on. Celtic ring on and everything. Yeah. That's the Alan was painting the hangar and admiring Joe's planes. I was doing a bit of work for Joe there, and I was spraying out the hangar from there for a while, and I was over them aircraft all the time. So, ah, they're the colour of Ireland, green, white, and gold, you know. I said, that'll do, that's the one. It's time for the DC-3 to make history once again. I guess I've never flown a, a wedding party in the air. Flow a lot of people home to get married or get divorced. Is that right side in here? No. It's all just one side. Uh, my name is David. I'm your flight attendant for today. This is the first time that Buffalo Airways ever had a wedding on this aircraft, so congratulations. So I go to Guam, come over all night and get married, so we'll be in the control zone for half an hour or so. Down at the hangar, TXW, the C-46 that gave Devin so much trouble, is ready to get back on the job. All is good. Take, take off RPM is perfect. Mechanics have traced the right engine's problem to a fuel pressure regulator. Sputtering in the left engine was caused by icing in the carburetor. We're good to go. Return to service. 
good news. Just in time for an urgent mission at a pipeline. There was an oil spill in Wrigley, which is a community just uh, north of uh, Fort Simpson. And uh, it's had an oil spill and they need, uh, you know, some sort of facility or some sort of kit flown in from Edmonton. Veteran co-pilot Ian Bottomley preps the C-46 for takeoff. He's joined by engineer Adam Smith. And Devin will be back in the captain's seat. We're all good. In the hood. Beginning of a long day of flying for the crew. They'll travel south to Edmonton, pick up an oil spill cleanup kit, then race back north to the leaking pipeline. We're gonna find out more details about it once we get down to Edmonton. It's, if it's one trip, if it's ten trips, we don't really know. What they do know is that this job can't wait. Oh, we got a lot of country to cover, yeah. A couple thousand miles to cover before the day's done today, so. Damn, I go get more with some breaks. Yeah, 366 Edmonton departure, radar identified. You're following a C-46, which is just north of the Devon. Three and a half hours later, they land at Edmonton International. And immediately start loading the plane. Just, that, no, no, that's perfect, right there. They're getting the last of the oil spill cleanup supplies aboard the plane so they can take them to Wrigley, Northwest Territories. That's a very, fairly time sensitive thing. The less stuff that gets uh, polluted and the quicker it gets fixed, the better. Still, we'll get another one. But as the crew returns to the plane for departure, they find that the weather has other ideas. I think it was 30 knots, gusting 45, which is like 50 kilometers, 60 kilometers an hour. That violent wind has just blown a big problem right into their flight path. We're dead. Simple as that. In Edmonton, Alberta, a Buffalo C-46 on an urgent mission has been damaged on the tarmac when a container was blown into the back of the plane. I see the airplane and it's got a shipping container wedged right up against the tail. It's done. It's all, I don't have another one. We're dead. Simple as that. It's one of your three critical surfaces, your elevator, your rudder, and your ailerons. You lose a chunk off that, it's not meant to fly without it. Yeah, it's windy down here, and they had, uh, you know, those uh, igloo things that go in 37s on the dollies. They, they didn't have the wheels lock and our V-tabs ruined. So we need a V-tab ASAP, I guess. The delay is a crushing blow to Buffalo's client, Rob McCullough. I didn't need that to happen today, for sure. Would have been nice to get the heck out of here. Me and Rod, you know, went into our spares, found a spare uh, trim tab. Luckily, it was a tab, uh, which is a part of the horizontal stabilizer that's easily replaced. You know, on the weekend, got it all working. Uh, luckily, WestJet was available to help us out. Early the next morning. I got a couple. That looks like it. Awesome. Yeah. That's your bolt. That's my bolt. Ten minutes and five bolts later, the part is in place. Nothing's hitting. Thanks for your help, Mark. We can go whenever we're ready.
after a wasted, frustrating day yesterday, Devin is ready to get underway. They're flying the cleanup supplies over a thousand kilometers north to the leaking oil pipeline near Wrigley Northwest Territories. It's water treatment equipment, uh, carbon filters, sand filters, uh, pumps, that kind of thing, hoses, all for the uh, water treatment system. Over northern Alberta, Devin and Ian noticed smoke from the wildfires that have been making headlines lately. There is a thing in the paper, Lost High School, Town Hall, and They can get around the smoke now, but they may not be so fortunate on the return flight. We made it to Wrigley. A couple days late, but that's par for the course. The clock hasn't stopped. The oil drip is still going. Time is ticking. The customer's paying good money. Up just a hair. The crew doesn't want to delay another minute. Could you just sit them on the ground for now? We got a flight plan. And just get it unloaded as fast as we could. If they make good time, Thanks. they can get back to Edmonton and return with the final shipment today. You ready to go, boss? Ready to go. As the crew flies back into Alberta, they're slowed down by a strong headwind. It's relentless. It hasn't let up at all in, uh, in the prairies. And as they slowly push farther south, the pilots see an even bigger problem ahead. That's the thing. It spreads like wildfire because just in six hours we've been gone. Holy. The wildfires have intensified with the wind and the smoke is blowing into Devon's flight path. Obviously forest fires, and it was just reddish and orange and black and yellow. Good little fire, is it? Uh, it's day so. The trouble on the ground is starting to cause trouble in the air. Heat comes up from the ground, and it's pushing us up and down and all around, so big severe turbulence. To feel it over here pushing the wings up. And there's a much more urgent threat to the crew. The whole airplane was just smoky. I looked up from my book and I was like, holy hell. Oh yeah, it's full of smoke. Might as well smoke the cigar. The biggest concern there is the crew not having enough oxygen. You get uh, hypoxic and uh, your decision making goes out the window and you gotta get out of that stuff when you, you do see it. Right now, flying the plane is hard work fighting all those drafts and everything. Like it's, it's a lot of work. They're fairly heavy controls. You sort of have to work the rudders a little bit to keep it somewhat coordinated, or you're just going to bounce all around. Pretty much impossible, I'd say, to keep it contained. That's why we've been in the smoke for so long. Devin and Ian are flying blind in a smoke screen now over 160 kilometers wide, with no end in sight. Just hoping we get out of our air soon. In the sky over northern Alberta, C-46 pilots Devin Brooks and Ian Bottomley push against the wind through thick ash and smoke from wildfires raging below. That was just 15 degrees to the right there to get away from this big fire club. But the smoke is spreading faster than they can fly. Every minute they spend inside it, the pilots are fighting violent updrafts and dwindling oxygen. You need to be able to breathe. It's like exercise all day long. They can't outrun the fire, and they can't wait to get to the other side. Devon has only one option. Just had to pop up there 500 feet here in uncontrolled airspace. And we realize we're at 700, but uh, smoke's getting pretty bad here. We just wanted to go up a little higher and make sure nobody else was coming the other way. That's not 515, would you like to climb to the with permission from the Edmonton Flight Center, Devin and Ian guide the 46 up and out of the smoke. Uh, dark stuff. 
I don't imagine we need to play much more. That was just probably the hot spot. It's getting lighter and lighter. When we finally got out of it, it was like, oh, we can breathe again. An hour later, they hone in on the Edmonton runway. We're off, I don't dirt complete. Clear to land the 100 step. Bring them up. But even though their flight's over, the wind isn't quite finished with the crew. Wow. That's brutal. Good thing we didn't bring Larry and Christy to blow away that little bastard. They still have one more flight to Wrigley, but they'll make it tomorrow. After this rush job that became a marathon, captain and crew have earned a rest. A fast job can sometimes turn into a freaking ordeal. It's the simple things that damn you, not the hard. Slow, bumpy, smoky. I've had better trips. All in all, though, we're here. One trip done. Let's see what's happening tomorrow. Devin's struggle with the fire is over. But just 200 kilometers north, the fires he flew through are still raging. And the town of Slave Lake is under siege. All 7,000 residents are fleeing. And the alarm is ringing up in Yellowknife. I'm gonna dispatch the guys and he'll go down there start fighting fires again. Buffalo's water bombers have been called to help their southern neighbors. Hey, Cord, it's Mike Hanley calling from Buffalo area. Just needing some information updated for the 218 contract in Fort McMurray. Yeah, we're going to have four Buffalo ducks there tonight. Well, probably here in about an hour, actually. The Alberta fires are so out of control, Buffalo is also sending two water bombers they just bought from Newfoundland. This deployment is Scott Blue's chance to fulfill his dream. Packed up this morning and here we are. With We're bags packed for three days to three months. Ready to go. We're gonna actually get the call that yeah, you're taking a plane to actually go on fire contract jobs. Like, wow, okay. Scott wanted the challenge of flying a fire mission. Now, the biggest challenge of his career is dead ahead.